What's up, everybody, and welcome back in. We've got an update already on this Las Vegas judge situation where she was attacked by a criminal defendant right as she was handing down his sentence in his sentencing hearing. A lot of questions were asked and answered yesterday on our video, and a lot of you have sent me a few updates, and we're going to talk about them now again to give us an opportunity to discuss the process, the system together, um, see if there are issues that we agree on or disagree on or what we think could make the process better. Um, we're going to get an update from the chief judge in her area. And we are going to, in that judge that was a tax area. And then we're going to also talk about some details that are being reported, charges um, that are coming his way, the bail that's been set for those charges, whether or not he's in custody currently, um, what we can expect from him kind of going forward. But I appreciate everybody jumping in, joining me, and asking their questions yesterday. If you have more follow-up questions, throw them in the comments. Um, especially, I think you're going to have questions and concerns with at least some of what we're going to discuss today. We'll also discuss how cases are, I mean, uh, states are a little bit different. And what happens in Nevada is a little bit different than what would happen in Florida. And I gave you some expectations of what I thought would happen to him and what I thought would happen with the situation with the current judge and what she would continue to do on his case or not and how... I'm used to it happening in Florida, uh, but let's take a listen to the chief judge now. Uh, we'll listen to his update, and then we'll get into some more of the details that are being reported as we go through this video. So hit that like button if you guys haven't already, um, and sit back and relax and get ready to ask your questions. Is everything working? Yes, sir. All right, so I'm going to give a little statement and then uh, I can take a few questions. First of all, uh, just to let everyone know about the incident, at a sentencing hearing for uh, Mr. Redden on January 4th. Is it January 4th? It's January 3rd. Uh, Deborah Redden, at least it looks like Deborah, his first name, is the criminal defendant. We watched the video yesterday jump over and attack the judge. So when they reference Mr. Redden, that's him. Yesterday. Today's the 4th. Sentencing hearing on January 3rd on the charge of attempt battery with substantial bodily harm. Mr. Redden attacked Judge uh, Mary Kay Holpus. Judge Holpus was injured and received medical attention and has been released. She remained sore and stiff, but thankful it was not more severe. Her marshal was transported uh, to the hospital, treated for a head injury and released. His injuries are still being treated. His name is Shan Shane Brandon. The law clerk, Michael Lasso, received medical attention and was released. He received hand abrasions. By the way, that's a correction I just want to make. A lot of us thought it was the court clerk. That's where they sit in a lot of situations. That is actually her law clerk. That was the hero of the day yesterday. And he was treated for what? Hand abrasions. How do you think he got those? Well, he was wailing on that criminal defendant as he was literally saving and protecting his judge that he is the law clerk for, not court clerk. What a law clerk does for a judge they do a lot of research. They prepare documents for them. If there are cases that are cited and motions filed by lawyers, the law clerk will look up those cases, make sure they're still good law. We used to call it shepherdizing to make sure there wasn't some case that had overruled the case that some lawyer cited that not that they were trying to trick the judge, but maybe they didn't do the right background. Um, so to make sure the judge has the right, correct, accurate, most up-to-date law in front of her so she can read it, uh, make her decision. And then if she's going to cite cases, he'll probably help her do that research provide a memo, just like a law clerk would in any law firm. Judges sometimes in certain jurisdictions, uh, a lot of times in federal court, they'll have multiple law clerks doing a lot of the research for them. That's who that person was in the black suit that came to the judge's rescue before a lot of law enforcement officers even did in the situation that was just kind of going crazy. Another thing that I saw, yes, the bailiff, marshal, whatever they call them in Nevada, in that courtroom, um, jumped and he was holding a bandage on his head yesterday. We saw it. Nasty injury to his forehead. Um, that also, again, he was trying to protect the judge. Jumped, just barely missed. Um, he was just behind the defendant. Nasty injury on his head, so we can understand he was doing his best. Everybody was doing their best, even if there were problems in the system, which this judge is going to talk about in the press conference. Um, some changes they're already trying to make uh, to make the courthouse an even safer place, but that it is, in fact, a safe place currently. We commend the heroic acts of Judge Holtus's staff, law enforcement, and all others who subdued the defendant. 
Judge Holtis wanted me to convey a statement. She wanted me to thank all of the well-wishers and others who have expressed concern for her and her staff. She is extremely grateful for those who took brave action during the attack. Um, I just want to make sure that uh, the public is aware that the courthouse is a safe place to be. Uh, this was a very unique situation, and we're doing what we can to uh, continue to maintain. I do agree with him. I know there were a lot of comments disagreeing with that yesterday, but the reason this is such a big deal and has captured the eyes and the attention of the nation is because it's so unusual. This is not something that happens every day. We're not talking about, you know, the streets of a big city potentially where crime may be high in certain cities. That's not what the courthouse is. Bad stuff happens every day there. And sadly, the nation doesn't care a lot about it. We do things as a society to try to protect and try to make the streets safer. And politicians run on that campaign slogan every so often, so it seems. But we never really hear about this stuff happening at the courthouse because it is a safe place, generally speaking. And it's going to get even safer now that something like this happened. Uh, the integrity of the court and the, the safety that we have here. Take a few questions if you have them. Yes. How is everyone doing emotionally after this? Obviously, very traumatic for everyone involved. Um, as far as the emotional resilience, we, we do have a wellness program here at the court that uh, um, Judge Alf has uh, been the head of for the, the past 18 months. We are already in the process. We have a uh, we've authorized crisis services for staff and for the judge if the need arises. We have a traumatologist that. Uh, we've been in contact with. That's pretty awesome, right? And a lot of you guys on this channel are so in tune with this stuff and mental health awareness and treatment and help in these kind of situations. They have a traumatologist. I didn't even know that was a thing. They've already authorized that. They've got a wellness program in place over the last 18 months. So that's great. A lot of you ask about that for the judges, for jurors, for court staff and personnel that have to go through some of these traumatic cases or traumatic events that they were actually a part of. So it's good that that stuff is in place. Um, and I think a lot of court systems should have that stuff in place because it's really important. So that's being provided if they, if they so desire. Judge, have you identified any changes to security measures for um, defendants who are out of court? This question was, have you identified any change to security measures? We talked about this yesterday. Policies, processes, procedures. So this is a very unique situation that, as far as I know, has never happened before with somebody supermaning over a, a judicial bench since yesterday um, and i heard you know a lot of people talking about how the benches are lower there still very unusual for somebody to as he said superman over that bench we met with our security contractor to bring in additional security personnel to support court, courtroom coverage we've notified clark county management that there's a need for additional marshal positions in our high-risk calendars we're already working with clark county real property management to evaluate courtrooms and identify if there are any necessary improvements. So interesting that it looked like he looked down and read that answer. So he knew that question was coming and was prepared. They have a security contractor they work with who they've talked to about making it safer. They talked about getting more marshals in there for high risk calendars, meaning when you're going to sentence potentially violent crimes, if you're going to sentence for them, or if you're going to sentence to prison, potentially what makes a calendar, a high risk calendar is something that needs to be defined. So potentially more marshals in place. And then they're also looking to see if there are any measures they can take, meaning do they need cameras? Do they need bars? Do they need more benches? Do they need um, different positioning like we talked about before? So they're looking into all that with their security expert that they contract with to set up the security in the courtrooms. We're already on top of doing everything we can to make it uh, make this as safe as possible for everyone. Yes. Uh, you said that, uh, so they already are trying to make it as safe as possible, but they're also looking for ways that can improve, especially in further or future high risk situations, because that does happen in court. And that's why, you know, we talk about all these things we have in place and questions we've had in other cases. Why is somebody automatically on suicide watch after they get convicted or even charged with a very serious crime, carrying with it a very serious penalty? This is why. Sometimes people do things that are even outside of their nature or character when they're faced with a decision that it seems like it can't get any worse. 
So when people are looking at a long prison sentence or even prison at all, they might think this is rock bottom. Nothing else matters. I'm going to do something absolutely wild, whether it's hurt myself or somebody else. And that's why that becomes a more high risk situation. And whether or not somebody actually makes a comment, sometimes that's where they end up in prison after their conviction or after their arrest. And now here, if they're going to be faced with an actual prison sentence or something that the court decides is high risk, what kind of additional security measures can we have in place, similar to how jails put people in solitary or on suicide watch for their own protection, whether they want it or not? We're looking at hiring more marshals. Is there a shortage of marshals right now? Um, there's always a shortage of marshals. Um, we, we think that uh, there, there could always be an increased security presence. So I don't love that answer, that there's always a shortage of marshals. That's like saying we're never as secure as we should be. I think that a plan can be put in place with what you have, or at least you can say we need 76 marshals or whatever it is in order for our perfect proper plan to be in place. And then if there's less than that, there's a shortage. If there's more, then there's an overage. If there's exactly that amount, then we're good. But there's always a shortage of marshals to me doesn't scream, you know, the courthouse is always safe, even though I get what he means. And you guys talked about it yesterday, the pay shortage, the work shortage, the, the difficulty in getting marshals and bailiffs in courts. So I understand what he's talking about, but I don't love the idea of settling for there's always a shortage of this or that, you know, and that's when you think about, I mean, I don't want to get into a whole conversation about government waste of funds and resources and time, but this is where it hurts. The same thing when I look at any budget for a business or if I'm on a board of something or and I see them saying, well, we don't have the money for that. We don't have the budget for that. Then I'm like, well, you're wasting all this money over here. Just get rid of that stuff and use it where we need it. And this is one of those areas where I'm like, this is where we need it. It would be better for the courthouse. How many marshals are in a court? Generally, we have one, mar one marshal in a court. Sometimes uh, there are two. Sometimes there are more. But generally, there's one. To what extent does so that one does not automatically mean it's not safe as long as he has the proper training and is in the proper position to protect from that courtroom. Now, to me, it does seem difficult to only have one. Most of ours have two, but that's the norm there. Marshals across the various judicial districts coordinate, collaborate, technique, support, training, etc. I don't know that I can answer that uh, in detail, but I know that they they do coordinate, collaborate with uh, with the other marshals. We have one marshal division uh, and, and they're all trained similarly. They have the, the same support network and same supervisory network. Um, I know we transfer people between uh, the family courthouse and our courthouse when, this, when the need arises. So there's there's coordination. Thank you, Judge. So if there was an increase in marshals in the courtroom, do you think this could have been prevented? Uh, I don't know. If there were more marshals in the courtroom, do you think this could have been prevented? I think the obvious answer to that is yes. If there was an additional marshal standing between the defendant and the judge, it could have been defended, er, uh, prevented. But it's a tough spot to be put in as the, the chief judge now because this, is, this was the norm and it was safe, but maybe we now need to adjust for high-risk situations. What could have prevented this. I mean, I, I think that we are looking at every opportunity we can to make things better. Um, I, I don't know if a, an additional marshal could have prevented it or not, but if we could get additional marshals in the courtroom, we think that that would uh, always be better for the, the court, for the, the staff we have here and for the public. That's not rocket science, right? The more law enforcement officers, more marshals, more bailiffs, more protection, more security, the safer it's going to be. But you can't have 20 marshals in every courtroom because guess what? 20 marshals would be safer than two. So just because it's safer doesn't mean we automatically have to have it. We have to find that line of reasonableness to make sure it is safe. And to me, two seems like that. Um, you guys let me know what you think in the comments. Seems like the safest kind of, that's still reasonable, obviously. Two questions. How many more marshals are you looking to add in each courtroom? I don't know that there's a definitive number for that. We would like to have a, a second marshal be available, at least for criminal calendars. Um, that's part of the reason that we met with our security contractor, uh, so that we can try to put a second person in the courtrooms as often as we can. And I like Jen that Holmes idea. Has been checked out. She's out. When do you expect her to be back at work? She was back at work today. Good for her. So that's a wild answer, right? 
Uh, so the first thing I talked about is they think to or have somebody available to be a second in the high risk or criminal calendars. Um, I think that's a good idea. I like that. Um, and again, that's something that seems doable and reasonable. So hopefully they do put that in place. The next question, in case you missed it, was when do you expect the judge to be back to work? And he said she was back today, which I think was yesterday the 4th, which would be the day after the attack. Went to the hospital, checked out, still sore and bruised. But guess what? She showed up to work the next day. And that's that's pretty cool. You know, I, I think that's pretty cool and commendable from that for that judge. So do we know how tall this individual was? Um, I've seen the same video that you guys have. I that that's all I know. I, I don't have any description of it. Sorry. In terms of those who did jump into action, it was really you know heroic to see, especially the clerk. I mean, maybe you could speak a little bit on that on those who did you know jump into action to protect the judge specifically. Well, I, I think this uh, Michael Lasso, her law clerk, was uh, probably the the primary person that, that pulled the defendant off of her and uh, probably kept her from having more severe injuries. So. We, we commend him for that. His, Mr. His Lasso. Heroic action. Another hero named Lasso. Thanks. Um, I think that's because in the video that we've all seen, it's kind of hard to make out. But was the marshal standing close enough to the defendant, or was he following protocol as to where he was standing in the courtroom? So I'm, another question about positioning of the marshal. Was he where he was supposed to be? I believe that the marshal was right behind the defendant, probably getting ready to uh, put handcuffs on him and remand him. And this individual just, uh, he, he moved too quick. And I, I think the marshal was right behind him, just couldn't get to him. A lot of people have talked about his criminal history. Do you think that he should have already been behind bars and maybe not have gotten so many passes? I got to be honest. There are some great questions in this press conference. And a lot of what we talked about yesterday, it's pretty funny. Um, funny, interesting, not haha. -ha. Um, so they asked like all these crimes that he had in the past, why wasn't he still in prison? And guess what? We're going to talk more about that at the end of the video. When we read through this article that is reporting some kind of interesting details about where he sits right now, even after all these additional charges. Um, that's not really a question that I feel comfortable answering. I, as far as I know, I was never one of the judges that uh, was involved in the sentencing of a prior case. To me, that sounds like he doesn't really agree with what happened in the prior cases. This guy with, I can't remember how many misdemeanors and three felonies and violent crimes in the past, multiple domestic violence um, issues, multiple chances in mental health court. Why is he out on the streets? Why is he not in custody? Why is he not cuffed during hearing, during uh, sentencing? Because of decisions other judges made. And I'm not going to disagree with them because I don't know what happened in those cases. But he's sitting here saying, I don't feel comfortable answering that, but I don't think I made the decision to let him out. Interesting answer by him, I think, but I don't know who's making the decisions on Mr. Redden, the defendant's current new charges, because I'll just, spoiler alert, he could very easily be back out on the streets as soon as right now, based on the bail amounts that were set that we'll get to. Um, I don't have any comment on that. So what exactly is he going to be charged with now? So what are the new charges? That's a great question. His new charges, he's going to be uh, he's being charged with battery on a protected person resulting in substantial bodily harm, battery, uh, two other counts of battery on a protected person, and one count of simple battery. So That's there's a report of a lot more charges that get kind of more detailed um, that maybe they are coming, maybe they're not, but I think they're interesting factually to discuss. But at the very least, three batteries on a protected person and one simple battery. Um, the simple battery is probably because it was less severe. Um, but the serious bodily injury could be the judge. Serious bodily injury to the marshal that we heard separated his shoulder. The huge, uh, the huge injury to the other marshal's head would be caused by this defendant. Even if he didn't hit that marshal, that marshal in the act of trying to stop this defendant from doing what he was doing could also be charged um, or he could be liable for those injuries as well. So we'll kind of see how this continues, but there are some other interesting charges that are being reported that we're going to talk about as well. It is because there are four individuals that were involved. Question. So what are the maximum, um, I guess, sentencing for those charges? And from our understanding, he was supposed to be, he was asking for probation and that was being denied, even though she was about to sentence him to 48 sessions. Exactly. Um, so Judge Holthus is going to uh, go forward with the sentencing hearing on 
I believe it's the, the 8th at 930. That's wild. So in three days, or on Monday, the judge that was just attacked by his defendant is going to go forward and sentencing him on Monday. If I was her, I'd recuse myself. Um, I, I just think that's just the better move for the appearance of the appearance of impartiality at this point. This guy has literally attacked and punched me, my clerk, my marshals, my bailiffs, everybody around. I don't think it's a great look that she's going to go in and sentence him now. I think she can. I think she can be impartial. I think um, all, I think one of the great things would be if she already had a sentencing memo kind of typed up where she had, I'm going to give him five years or I'm going to give him two years or whatever it may be. And she says she can show this was all typed out beforehand. I'm going to give him the same sentence now. I'm not going to enhance everything. I realize that any enhancement or additional time will be on the new crimes, not on the crime I was already going to sentence him on. So maybe she could prove that. If I was his lawyer, I would probably ask for her to recuse herself. Um, no disrespect to her. Uh, my client sucks at this point, basically, and made a bad decision. And she has every right to hate him more because of what he's done. But it really shouldn't legally be taken out on that prior sentence. Because that prior sentence is supposed to be for the prior crime and things that happened in the past. So let him be sentenced for that. And then anything that happened from this encounter should happen on future charges that are coming down the pipe right now. So very interesting to me. I, I would be surprised if this would happen in Florida. We'll see if his lawyer um, files any motions for her to recuse herself or disqualification motions. Um, but at this point, they don't seem to have a problem with it. They're going to let her sentence him literally on Monday, five days after he viciously attacked her. Um, now I don't know exactly what the sentence that she planned on handing down was, but I anticipate that it'll be the same as... Uh, what she gives. So he doesn't expect her to enhance it either. He expects it to be the same sentence she was going to give that day. Let me know in the comments if you think she should be the one handing down the sentence. I'm sure a lot of you are going to say, good, let her get a, a lick in on him because he got all those licks in on her or whatever. But let me know what you think. Legally, morally, just as a person, I'm sure um, feels a little bit like karma, but let me know what you think. I, I like to read your comments on these type of situations to get a gauge of what the public thinks about this. Somebody not in the legal world. Do you think it's appropriate? On the 8th. She will be handling the sentencing. Okay. I have to ask this. So the judge made a comment right before the strike about something to the fact that he's going to be receiving something different now. Is that appropriate? Uh, is that appropriate for her to say? So many of the same questions you guys had. Was the comment she said before he attacked her appropriate or did it cross any lines? I think uh, every judge has their own discretion how they, uh, what they say to a, an individual in court. Um, I think that what she was saying, I think they were asking for probation that she was saying that something different was appropriate in this case. I think that's what caused him to jump over the table. Which we've watched some sentencing where judges say a lot worse. Some of you maybe have had a problem with that. I didn't have a problem with anything she said personally. Well, I'm sure you guys have seen all the YouTube uh, videos. Uh, there's there, there's plenty of instances where somebody is, uh, you know, becomes rowdy in the courtroom, and the marshals generally are able to subdue them. This is the first one I've seen where somebody uh, supermaned over the the judicial bench. Can you give us an idea of what the court will look like on the 8th with Brennan and um, Judge Holtis, the security measures that would be implemented? I don't have, I don't know yet. We're still in the process of uh, figuring out what, what needs to be done to make the court as safe as possible. But, but we, that, that's our whole goal is to, to maintain the public trust and confidence in the court system and, and let people know that it is a safe place to be, and this is not going to happen again. We're taking whatever steps that we can to make sure that something like this doesn't happen in the future. To, to your knowledge, this is the first time that this has happened in, um, in this courthouse and to this judge? My knowledge is the first time it's happened anywhere. Um, I've never seen a, a video of somebody diving across a, a court bench like that before. So, one more question. 
So as a chief, what would be your message to some of the other judges? My message to the other judges is that uh, we're going to do everything we can to make this a safe place, for not only for the judicial, uh, for the judges, but for their staff and for the public. That's that's our goal. You also got to protect the gallery, you know, behind where the criminal defendant is. So it's it's difficult. Where where should that marshal stand? Because if he would have been standing between them and the judge, maybe he attacks somebody in the gallery. So again, that's why I think two kind of spatially positioned in the right spot is probably the safest and most reasonable uh, measure for the courtroom. Just to, to make the, the courthouse as safe as, as we can. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Now let's take a look at this article. That some of you have sent over. Um, man seen the video attacking judge will remain in custody with bail. He violently attacked the judge, refused to go to court Thursday. So he was supposed to go to his first appearance for these charges. Apparently on Thursday, he refused to go. So how does somebody refuse to go? They lay in their prison cell. They refuse to get up and they don't have a situation in place where they drag him into court bound and cuffed. So instead he refuses. He'll get a failure to appear, potentially additional charges. They're probably misdemeanor charges again at this point. He's probably feeling, what do I have to lose? Doesn't really matter. But he didn't show up to court, which again tells us what he thinks about this system at this point. And he will remain in custody with a $54,000 bond. $54,000 is a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. But he would only need to post $8,100 to be released from custody, according to this report. So in Florida, you only need to put up 10%. So he'd only be looking at $5,400. In Nevada, it says here, that uh, they have to put up 15% for a bond, um, which would be $8,100. And in case you're wondering, if you put up $54,000 and you win and you're not guilty, you get that money back. Um, if there are court costs or fines to be applied, if you're guilty, they'll take it out of that $54,000. If there is restitution, they'll take it out of that. Um, but when you post a bond and you give it to a bail bondsman, that $8,100 or $5,400 if it's 10% is gone. And you don't get that money back even if you're not guilty. Um, that's just a little side note. But for $8,000, this guy can be back out on the street. Like, this is how we get the next Daryl Brooks, where it's like, this guy feels like he's got nothing to lose. Somebody pisses him off on the wrong day, and he just goes wild and does the unthinkable. It just seems wild to me. And again, based on what that chief judge just said, well, I don't think I was any, but I was any of the judges that made the decisions that, you know, let him be back out there and not in custody. Well, another Nevada judge has made the decision to set a very, very low bond. A very low bond. Now, I don't know what the norm is for these charges with his history, but to me, this is tough. And again, he knows he's getting sentenced on Monday, January 8th, right? So if he has somebody that can post this bond for him, 8,100 bucks, he has the weekend to live it up maybe one last time before he's in prison because he knows he's going to prison for whatever he was going to be sentenced on January 3rd. And he's going to go to prison on January 8th. And then he's going to have these additional charges, which is going to be more prison time. Like everybody knows that at this point, there's a video of it. If you're already in prison, the likelihood of you getting more prison as versus probation for a violent crime like this is slim to none. You're definitely going to get prison. So he's going to be in prison for a long time starting January 8th. Now, hopefully he thinks it's just a waste of money or whoever was going to help him out with the money would say, this is a waste of money just for you to get out for two days. And he'll just stay in custody until January 8th. Um, he was appearing in court since to be sentenced for attempted battery. That's what he was going to be sentenced on January 3rd. And now will be sentenced on January 8th by judge Holthus. Um, video had millions of views jumping over the podium. All right. So here are the new charges that they are reporting here in this article. He faces charges of coercion with force or threat of force extortion, intimidating a public officer with threat of force disregarding the safety of a person resulting in substantial bodily harm, battery by a probationer or parolee, unlawful act regarding bodily fluid by a prisoner in confinement, that could probably be spit, um, and seven counts of battery on a protected person. So it is very interesting to think for all these additional charges, because again, the intimidation, the extortion, the threat of force is, you better not send me to prison, I'm going to do this to you now. If you try to send me to prison in the future, I'm coming for you again. That's the kind of threat of force they're talking about that I fa I think factually it does fit these facts, that crime. 
He's in custody in the Clark County Detention Center, but he refused to be transported for an initial appearance Thursday in front of Judge um, Diefenbach. During the hearing, prosecutors asked for Renton to be held without bail. Without bail. I think that's reasonable at this point. He's got a bunch of convictions. He pled guilty, so that's technically done. He's pled guilty. He hasn't been sentenced. So you can tack that felony on top as the fourth felony. And then you obviously have another violent crime where while he's presumed innocent, as crazy as that may seem, the evidence against him is great. Meaning a lot. And the crime is serious and the community safety is at risk. But instead, Diefenbach said $54,000 until argument until attorneys can present arguments at a later date. The judge said, I'm comfortable making any decisions without the defendant present especially if it's a decision that benefits the defendant. Um, but she ordered him back in court on Tuesday for another hearing. So Monday's a sentencing hearing on the original battery or attempted battery. Tuesday, he'll be back in court to deal with all of these charges. This attorney said he's disappointed that he was not denied bail. We asked that he be denied bail and detained because we strongly believe that he's a danger to the community. I agree. The world has seen what happened yesterday, this person's behavior in court, and I've almost seen nothing else like this. The judge's head hit the wall. Redden attacked the judge by pulling her hair and hitting her. She also had lower back pain and went to the hospital for that. Uh, judge Holthus wanted Judge Weiss to convey a statement. She wanted to thank all of the well wishes well, wishers, sorry, and others who have expressed concern for her, for her and her staff. She's extremely great, grateful for those who took brave action during the attack. And then, you know, they go through what he kind of what he said in his statement. And then they go through some of his criminal history, which again, we saw in that hearing. He's previously kicked officers. Reaction happened so quickly. We don't know if anything could have been done to prevent it. It's a unique situation. Again, a lot of what we already saw in that press conference. So it looks like this is one that's going to have some continuing um, updates. If you guys are interested, if you want me to keep following this case and you want more updates, let me know and I'll continue to do it. If you're over it and we've kind of uh, discussed what you thought needed to be discussed, that's fine with me. But it presents an interesting situation courtroom safety, and also pretrial detention, bails, bonds, when people should and shouldn't be released. When do they cross the line of being too dangerous to the community or showing that they're not going to follow sometimes simple, sometimes obvious, sometimes difficult rules and procedures. So let me know what you guys thought in the comments. Uh, hit that like button if you haven't already. Please make sure you subscribe. The subscribers pick the content. Like I just said, they'll tell me if we want to continue with this case or move on to another or add a different one. So I love to hear from you guys. I appreciate your comments and questions so much. Make sure you get them in there in the comments section. Till next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tregos, The Lawyer You Know.